Hi everybody, it's Brittany with Youth Power 365. And as we roll into the holidays, um, I want to remind you all to fill out the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid. And before I roll into this, there's a few things that I want to debunk. Um, if my parents are wealthy, I shouldn't apply for FAFSA, wrong. Um, you actually will not be eligible for many scholarships without this, um, as well as school-based funding. Um, they all use a number that comes out of the FAFSA. Um, so that's the main one that I wanna debunk. Um, also that your EFC is final. Also incorrect, um, the student aid department is working really hard to be flexible with families this year as many of our financial situations have changed due to COVID. So. Um, if you've previously feel like you've made more or like your 2019 tax return is not reflective of where your family will be, you can work with your college as well as the student aid department to adjust that number. So um, do not fret. I think FAFSA is made out to be really scary and really hard. Um, it's just knowing the facts and how to understand each question. So I hope this is helpful for you. Um, and I even passed this presentation and here to be a resource for you and your family. So FAFSA, free application for federal student aid. With this said, if you are filling out an application at the end, it asks you to pay, you are not on the right page. That is a scam. You know, that is a scam. Do not pay. Okay, this is a free application. So student aid from FAFSA is money provided by the federal government or another entity such as a school or a state government to help students pay for college or career. So again, this is where you heard me talk about some debunking, right? That EFC number, which we will talk about, estimated family contribution is used by your state and school and scholarship providers to determine scholarship grants, institutional aid as well. So there are three kinds of federal aid that I want to cover with you guys. The first one are federal grants. And there are a few and they all have different qualifiers as well. So the Pell Grant is for um, low income students. You need to be making, um, your EFC needs to be below $5,500 to qualify for the Pell Grant. And your college gets to determine how much you get it each year you can get up to sixty five hundred dollars out of the pell grant each year so it's not like sixty five hundred over four years that is each year and again your college gets to determine how much money out of sixty five hundred that you are eligible for um, the federal supplement educational opportunity teacher education assistance or for college and higher education, as well as the Iraq and Afghanistan service grants. So there are a few federal grants that this will qualify you for if you meet the requirements. The second one that we hear about a lot are loans. Um, federal loans are typically lower in interest. And because students that are 18 um, really don't have established credit, they don't look at that. So two things, subsidized and unsubsidized. Those are words you will see. Subsidized loans do not accrue interest while in school and they are provided based on financial need. Unsubsidized loans do accrue interest while you're in school and they have no requirement of financial need. So you know, if you have a high EFC, but you still need assistance with school, you will likely have all unsubsidized loans. 
And then lastly is work study. I have a lot of questions about work study. So work study provides a student a part-time job on or near campus and the funds earned through that job are filed through taxes, but are not counted on your FAFSA. So essentially that income does not like count against you um, in an estimated family contribution. It's fantastic. It's a great way to get a job on campus. I would highly recommend saying yes, you would consider work study if you think you're going to work while you're in college at all. This can be everything like I worked in the school cafeteria for <laughs> three years, um, everything to working the desk at the fitness center, um, being a teacher's assistant, all of those things, working in the library, those all qualify for work study. So why do I have to complete the FAFSA? Again, this is a bit where I began kind of debunking. One, access student loans with the lowest interest rates. Two, qualify for scholarships and grants. Three, situations change and you can always modify your request. But if you don't fill it out by the deadline, there is no wiggle room for you. And some schools actually do look at the completion of FAFSA as a requirement to be admitted to school. While there, um, while there are some schools that are need blind and it doesn't matter if you fill out the FAFSA, many schools do not fall into that category. Okay. So there are some terms you're going to hear that I want you all to understand. EFC, I've said this already a few times, is your estimated family contribution. COA is the cost of attendance. Net price is an estimate of the actual cost a student must pay each academic year. And award letter is a letter provided by each university listing all financial aid awarded to that student. So let's break this down. How to prepare for the FAFSA application. This is kind of your timeline, summer. I highly recommend gathering all the necessary materials to complete the FAFSA. October 1st, it opens. Two weeks to one month after applying, you will receive your student aid report, which you can find via email when they send it to you or by logging back into your account. And April, May, um, you'll be able to compare all the financial packages provided by your schools that have received your student aid report. So the needed materials, you will need not only you as a student, your social security number, but of your parent or parents, tax returns for students and parents. And I highly recommend for your parents if they file together that you have their W-2s, there's one question that you will need that for. Bank statements, checking and savings accounts um, and the amount in those as well as any investment information other than your first home. Before you fill out the FAFSA application, students and parents both need to create an FSA ID. And an FSA ID is essentially an ID that follows you in any funding that you receive for the rest of your life. So make sure while you're filling this out, like you document all of your login information um, as you don't wanna lose that. It is actually surprisingly difficult to recover. So you are going to visit studentaid.gov backslash FSAID. 
For this, you will need social security number, date of birth, and your full legal name. Make sure the name that you use is the name that is on your social security card or on your birth certificate. No nicknames. Um, if you have two last names, you need to use both. Again, both students and parents will need an FSA ID. Use an email, username, and password you will remember. Your FSA ID is connected to your social security number, and again, it will follow you for life. Record your information in a safe place, aka your login information, and then you are going to use your FSA ID to sign FAFSA documents and speed up your application. If you are not eligible for an FSA ID, or well, if your parent is not eligible for an FSA ID, uh, meaning they do not have a social security number, there is a way for them to still sign and for you to mail that piece in. It just takes, you know, seven to 14 days longer for them to have a complete application from you. This is what the FSA ID web page is going to look like. Next, we're going to move to the FAFSA. So, you know, you will get your FSA ID approved. Um, you'll get an email that says, yay, you can use your FSA ID for FAFSA now. And this is your time to be like, sweet, it's October 1st. I'm going to complete my application. So you're going to visit the FAFSA website. Um, if you are a male 18 to 25, select yes on the selective service. If you have a license, you have already um, registered for the selective service. If you do not have a license, I would highly recommend that you go online and do that um, right now. You will create a save key, which is how you will log back into your FAFSA um, application and continue it. You do not need to finish this all in one giant chunk. Take some breaks, um, eat some dinner with your family, etc. Um, and then you will add your personal information. So fafsa.ed.gov does have pop-ups. So um, make sure you enable those so everything goes smoothly. Okay. One, you will need to at least uh, list one school you are planning to attend. You can list up to 10 schools. Um, so if you're applying to eight and you're not sure if you what ones you want to attend, just put all eight in here. Um, some states do require a certain order of school listing to receive state aid. Um, and I would just look that up. Colorado is not one of them, so do not worry about it. Um, unless you're applying out of state, then just look up that school's regulations. And schools are not able to see the other institutions you have listed. So if you're afraid of like your acceptance wavering because um, schools are able to see where else you've applied, that's not going to happen with the FAFSA. So determining dependency, um, this actually changed when I was in college, unfortunately, um, where you are, de are dependent if one, your parent claims you on taxes, two, you are under 24, three, an undergraduate student. You are an independent student if you, you are married, you have children, you are older than 24, have or are serving in the military, 
are legally emancipated from your parents or declared homeless. With this said though, um, you know, if you are a graduate student um, or your parents do not support you, um, come and talk to myself or your counselor um, will help you find avenues to receive the proper support as a student. So if you are a dependent student, just in reporting your parents' information, you must list your parents. If your parents are divorced, um, provide parental information for the parent you have lived with most for the past 12 months. If you have divorced parents and you have a step parent, this is kind of where it gets messy, so bear with me. If you have a step parent and they live with you and are married to your parent, you must include their information. Um, if your step parent is widowed, they do not count as a parent. Let me break that down a little bit. You may have a step parent, but they do not file taxes with your mom or dad. Um, and then they also are not married to them. If that is the case, you do not need to claim them. But if they are married, if they file taxes together, you do. Same sex parents, um, that they're married parents. So you report them just the same as any other parents. And then if you do not live with your parents and they do not support you, but you are not legally emancipated, you still must claim them as your parents. So um, if you have zero contact with your parents or parent, um, again, please email me. That's a special circumstance that we will work through together. Parental information. So from your parents, you're going to need their name, right? Their legal name, date of birth, their social security number, marital status, state of residence, household size, tax information, asset information, and untaxed income. Whew, quite the list. For 2021-22, um, your 2019 tax returns are required. So again, when you're filling out the FAFSA, make sure you're doing the 2021-2022 application. Um, the IRS retrieval tool this year, I have not been able to make it work. It's really picky on how you qualify to use that tool, um, but it does allow you to automatically transfer your tax information to the FAFSA form. If the IRS retrieval tool doesn't work, it's not a big deal. You manually enter your information into the FAFSA. If you're confused at any point in manually filling this out, every question has this really cool like little question mark um, next to the question. Just click on it and it will describe what it's asking from you. So signing in and some or signing and submitting the FAFSA. Before I talk about this, I do kind of want to talk about how the questions are structured on the FAFSA. So when our tax returns were changed, we don't just like have a 1040 anymore. We have like a 1040 and a schedule one and a schedule two and all of these different schedules. Be careful when you read the questions because it might say, Add line 10, you know, line one from the 1040 plus line one from schedule one. Let me pause there. Where do you find the document names? They are going to be in the top left corner of your documents. So please make sure you are looking at the right document and adding the correct numbers from the right documents. Second, make sure you are reading that question fully. Again, so you are adding the correct boxes and amounts from the correct documents. 
Otherwise, filling out FAFSA is really just adding together a bunch of numbers. So keep your phone calculator out. If you do not have like a schedule one or a schedule two, that's okay. There is not something wrong with your tax return. Not everybody has them. So if you don't have the form or there, you have the form and there isn't an amount in that box, that's okay. You add zero or subtract zero or whatever mathematical equation it is asking you to do. Once you complete the FAFSA, um, you are going to sign it with your FSA ID and password, both the parent and the student. If your parent cannot create an FSA ID, meaning they do not have a social security number, you're just going to print that signature page and mail it to them. Um, and then they'll review your application once they receive it. Once you properly submit your application, you are going to receive a confirmation page via email um, and immediately upon completion. I highly recommend that you print this confirmation page. Your confirmation page may allow you to apply for state aid directly. Um, do so if it does. Also, your confirmation page offers the option to transfer parent information to another student's application. So if you have a sibling or a twin that will be using FAFSA, be sure to use this option. Okay, a lot of information. My apologies. Special circumstances, again, legal status. FAFSA does not ask for your parents' legal status. When you get to their social security number, you can apply as a student to FAFSA without your parents having a social security number. You will put zeros in for their social security number. Do not use an ITIN number or a different residency number. It will not count and it will make your application extremely difficult to recover. It's going to tell you that it is not like, that's not accepted. Press it two to three times and it will go through. Um, just so you know. So it'll, it'll pop up red at first and say you can't apply, keep pressing next. Another one is unwilling un and unable parents. So there are students whose parents are incarcerated, um, that you are in an abusive situation, you're dislocated from your home, a parent has been deported, um, and you are not 24 but self-sustaining. Again, please find me or go talk to your school counselor for these special, special circumstances so we can work through them with you. And then again, income discrepancy. I've mentioned this a few times. Submit as requested and speak with each school's financial aid department about your circumstance. Does it take a lot of work? Yes. Is it worth saving the dollar? Also, yes. So when you submit your FAFSA, there's a few different things you will see um, when you log back in. So processing means that your application is still processing. It typically takes three to five days to process, but really I think it's more like two to three weeks. Be patient. Um, process successfully means your application was processed and there's no further action needed. Um, which means that you should have a student aid report somewhere. Um, whether that's in your profile for FAFSA or it's been emailed to you, it's really in both places, so just look. Um, missing signatures, your application is missing the required signatures. This might happen to some students because they're waiting for your paper signature. Action required means, oops, you made an error. Um, so, you need to contact the schools you've applied to to resolve the issue. And then paper form, if you've submitted a paper FAFSA form, which really is not happening anymore, um, you can check roughly seven to 10 days after you've mailed it to see if they've received it.
So following up, right? You've submitted your FAFSA, all of these things. Your journey isn't quite done. I'm sorry. I know it's such a long process. So you are going to get the student aid report. And this is an example of a student aid report. So let me break this down a little bit. It's going to say your, the application receipt date and the day that it was processed. Um, again, you are going to see the last four of your social at the top. EFC, this is the estimated family contribution, which the EFC is the amount of money that the United States government believes you can provide each year to your child's education. Again, this is what they expect you to pay. This is the number that you can negotiate. Um, and then DRN, this is really just like a, a number um, that they use for like processing and information. So if you have to call and they ask for your DRN, again, that's where you find it, it's in that box. Um, and then the first paragraph is going to tell you if you are eligible for the Pell Grant. Again, I told you it's usually under $5,500. So this person is not eligible for the Pell Grant. And it says it right here. So comparing aid packages, right? So you're going to get your student aid report and essentially your colleges get that student aid report. And they are going to take the cost of attendance at that school minus the EFC, the estimated family contribution from your school, or I mean, excuse me, from your FAFSA. They are going to then subtract institutional aid and subtract other scholarships and then determine your financial need, which is the amount of money left over that you need to pay. So I highly recommend after you complete FAFSA, you need to review scholarships from private entities as well as the scholarships from your school. Not every school automatically applies scholarships to your account. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to apply for them and most times have to apply for them in a separate portal. So I do want to talk about scholarships, okay. Um, dollars for scholars. Youth Power 365 runs this. Um, we typically give between $300,000 and $350,000 each year. It's due March 1st. The link is youthpower365.dollarsforscholars.org. It's only for local students. Fill it out. Great chance to get funds. Daniel's Fund. This is a full ride scholarship. Parents must make less than $85,000 collectively. And I've posted a link for you. Guardian Scholars is a full ride to Colorado Mesa or Colorado Mountain College. Um, you must be a financial need. You must have above a 3.0 as well. And I have posted the link for Guardian Scholars. Um, there, I want to say there are also other local scholarships out here. You can look at Ville Resorts. You can look at Rotary. Um, there is Crawling for Cure. And then there are some like, national platforms that we can look at as well for scholarships. So if you are somebody who's like, I need to apply to as many scholarships as I can, please reach me. Um, this is my information. So um, best way to reach me right now is to send me an email so we can set up a Zoom meeting to talk about all of your needs. Um, also, I can help answer questions about the FAFSA. A lot of students take a picture of what they're seeing on their screen and then they send it to me and ask, what does this mean? Um, so I'm here for you, no matter what the question is. So please feel free to use me as a resource. I want every student to have access to the proper funding um, that they deserve. So thank you for watching this incredibly um, informative and 
dense presentation, but I hope it helps you understand the FAFSA just a little bit more. Thank you.